Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Matt Miller, and I am here as part of the Walt Whitman Initiative's Robust American Love Speaker Series. And I'm here today with Stephen Herman and Jay Sherry to introduce them and to present to you what I think will be an absolutely fascinating talk on Carl Jung and his ideas and how they relate to Walt Whitman. But first, let me say just a few words about the Walt Whitman Initiative, the group that's presenting the talk. Uh, the Walt Whitman Initiative is a New York City-based Whitman-themed, I guess you could say, uh, cultural outreach group. We're um, scholars of Whitman, lovers of Whitman, artists, poets, musicians, um, people who've come together to promote Whitman and his work. And we've been doing our best to keep that up during this challenging time um, with the pandemic and COVID-19. And the Robust American Love Speaker Series is our attempt to stay in touch with you and to keep sharing um, the word of Whitman. This is the third talk in the Robust American Love Speaker Series. Uh, the first one was on Walt Whitman and race. Uh, the second was on Walt Whitman and his New York City roots. And today we'll be taking a Jungian look at Whitman as well as looking at Jung himself. Um, so I hope you're uh, ready and excited for this like I am. Um, I'll start by uh, introducing Jay, one moment. Should have the bio called up there, sorry. So um, Jay, I know from the Walt Whitman Initiative, um, is a friend of mine, and he's also a PhD and has taught history and psychology at Long Island University in Brooklyn. Jay Sherry is currently the chairman of the Christine Mann Library at the Jung Center of New York, and he is the author of Carl Gustav Jung, Avant-Garde Conservative, and also The Jungian Strand in Transatlantic Modernism. Also with us today is Stephen Herman, also PhD, MFT, and is a Jungian analysis analyst and with a practice in Oakland, California. He's our special guest today. Um, thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Stephen is the author of Walt Whitman, Shaman, Spiritual Democracy, and the World Soul, which was published in 2010. And I'm really excited about this. I've been thinking about um, how to open it up. Um, I guess I wanted to start by asking you to just a kind of a nuts and bolts question, maybe to kind of lay the foundation for the rest of the talk, because I expect that maybe some people here uh, may not have as, a clear idea of the relationship between Young and Whitman in terms of you know, the historical context and um, any uh, influence relationship um, that might have been there. So I thought I'd by, by asking, I think this, question might go best to Jay, um, about uh, the kind of chronology of Whitman and Jung as they relate to one another, um, and anything we might know about any kind of influence that may have happened one way or the other. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Matt. Uh, I want to welcome all the uh, audience uh, to our talk tonight. Jung was born in 1875. So he was a mere lad of 17 when Walt Whitman died in 1892. So there was an overlap, of course, in age, but a minor one as far as the two men's direct connection. Jung was a Swiss-born psychiatrist, probably most famous as a colleague uh, of Sigmund Freud, and then eventually striking out on his own as a pioneer with a new direction for depth psychology. Um, and I'll save some of the elaborations, you know, for my portion of the talk tonight, Matt, because although Jung and Whitman had no direct connection, of course, in fact, Whitman's name never appears in any of the indices in any of Jung's voluminous writings. But as we'll see a little bit later when I do the presentation portion, Jung did own a copy of Leaves of Grass, and we'll talk about the people who were involved with that with Jung. So with that said, maybe I'll let Stephen elaborate a little bit on maybe an opening remark. Stephen? In terms of influence, I want to address Matt's question. Uh, what we do know is that Jung did read three of William James's works uh, the Principles of Psychology, 
the varieties of religious experience and pragmatism, all of which have numerous quotes, uh, lengthy ones and commentaries by William James. Uh, we don't have any uh, evidence yet that Jung commented on these uh, uh, passages, um, but he clearly uh, was aware of Whitman uh, through his reading of William James. Got it. He actually met in 1909 uh, at Clark University. Jung, Jung met James. Mm -hmm. By then, Whit Whitman, of course, had died in 1892. Helpful. I, I, that'll probably help people to kind of, you know, put them in perspective a little bit. Um, I wonder, I, you know, I guess we don't know since he didn't speak directly about it, but as you guys proceed, one other thing I'd love to hear from you guys would be your speculative attempt to, to assess what you think Jung, how Jung would have analyzed or assessed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, for example, um, William Butler Yeats, the, the Irish poet, kind of I think he kind of applied Jung to Whitman himself. Uh, he had a kind of Jungian outlook on life and his mystical philosophy, kind of very much about archetypes and so on. And he turned Whitman into this kind of wild old man archetype um, in his book, The Tower, um, in his mystical prose writings. Um, I was wondering if you, I, I know that, I guess, you know, Jung didn't directly do this himself, but if he had, um, speculating on it, that's just something I'm, I'm kind of curious about myself, if you think he would have somehow, you know, plugged Whitman's archetype, as you will, into some kind of a, you know, universal cast. Well, I think if I may jump right in there, I think you mentioned Wild Old Man from Yates, but that would relate, I think, in a way to what Jung called the wise old man archetype. And this would talk, you know, archetypes are not static, as we know. They evolve over millennia in the human race, but also throughout our own life cycles. And this would relate to what Jung called the individuation process. Whitman is one of the world's great examples of a creative individual who never stopped growing and developing. Um, and I would say he would be a brilliant case study for a union take on what's called the individuation process. That throughout our life cycle, the, the supreme achievement is to express our own unique individuality, which for, for Whitman and also for Jung relates to what we call the self. So that's my response, Matt. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, I don't want to, you know, get in the way of you two. I imagine you guys can probably have a better conversation since you're the experts on this than, than I can by leading you in. So maybe I'll kind of pass the baton off and um, let you guys take this wherever you want. Okay, thank you, Matt. And the way we've structured this is I'll, I'll take the lead a little bit early on. Steve then will follow and then we will join together to both read and then analyze, as I said previously, Whitman's poem, Chanting the Square Deific. Sounds great. My point of entree, of course, of familiarity with Jung, like so many of us, when there were still legitimate high school literature classes <laughs> that did surveys, of course, I was exposed to Whitman like so many of us. And certainly it touched me, uh, but in no great depth. But then with my Jungian studies and personal work and writing, I knew that Whitman was so much kind of intertwined with my interest in Jung, but it really deepened uh, when I was doing research for my second book, The Jungian Strand, when I started to do extensive research on a very little studied trip that Jung made to New York City in 1913. Now there is a shelf full of biographies of Jung. They are good, bad, and often very indifferent. <laughs> but although they cover what I call the stations of the cross approach to Jung's life, they often use his famous autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflection, almost as a template. They take the structure of that famous autobiography and they fill it out with facts, but they don't deviate too much. And one of the things that has always been 
overlooked by scholars and biographers is this 1913 visit. Now, this is very important time in Jung's career. Over New Year's of 1913, Jung had just decisively broken his relationship with Freud. And this is very important. Jung was the so-called crown prince of psychoanalysis. Freud figured that Jung would take on his mantle as leader of the movement. But like great students and colleagues, Jung just had to go his own way. And he sent a, a breakup letter over New Year's of January, 1913. But then he shows up in New York City in March. And this really intrigued me. You know, the, the, it took a long time to go through letters and all that stuff that scholars do in the archives. It turns out that he was invited to New York City by a, a colleague of his name, Beatrice Hinkle. She was a San Francisco uh, doctor who came east to New York. She went on to Europe where she met both Freud and Jung. So she was a leading American psychotherapist by this time. And it turned out in his split with Freud, she sided with Jung, which was remarkable. And so she set up the invite to Jung to come to New York. And my research showed that she introduced Jung to not just an uptown professional audience, but to a downtown Greenwich Village bohemian circle who were attracted to psychoanalysis in general, but also to Beatrice Hinkle herself. And what I want to do now is hold up a picture of my girl Beatrice. <laughs> so can we get that? Oh, my screen isn't showing this. A little higher up on the screen. There you go. Can we get that? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Of course, we all know Walt Whitman, but there on the other side is Beatrice Hinkle. Huh. It's, it's probably a publicity shot of Hinkle, but what I want to point out to you all is what I call her casual collar. Oh. <laughs> by, by this time, the whole Greenwich Village crowd was in to Walt Whitman. Trouble, his famous colleague and uh, uh, whatever the figure is. Uh, caretaker. Caretaker, thank you, man. I lost the word. Trouble was part of the circle. He spoke to this group in New York. They knew him. So this was part of a very important bohemian, avant-garde, literary, cultural circle. Huh. And Hinkle was right in the center of it. Um, so she invites Jung. He speaks to the liberal club, which was the leading reform club in New York. But also, he met her friends of the heterodoxy club, which was America's first modern feminist organization. Right. And Beatrice was what I call their den mother. She was older. Many of them were meeting her for analysis and what is now called consciousness racing sessions. She was quite a woman. Yeah. Um, so here is Jung also loosening up his own collar by meeting not professional psychologist and psychiatrist, but he was so-called letting his hair down <laughs> by meeting a downtown crowd. He also attended with Hinkle the famous Armory Show, which was very famous at that moment in America's cultural history. So this was quite a moment in Jung's career and 
in American cultural history. Well, Hinkle didn't stop there. She was in the process of translating his famous book, which is now known as Symbols of Transformation. It was his intellectual declaration of independence from Freud. Her English language translation turned out to be a bestseller and was read by such talents as Eugene O'Neill, Jack London, and D.H. Lawrence. So this book had a huge impact on all three of these people that we now know independently with their famous careers. So this is where Jung intersects with Whitman. It turns out Jung owned a copy of Leaves of Grass. It was the 1914 Mitchell Kennerly edition. Since the, the book appeared one year later than his visit, I have concluded it was very likely a gift from one of his young American admirers. In particular, I speculate it was a young poet named James Oppenheim who wrote lyrical poetry influenced by both Jung and Whitman. So I surmise that a year later, the book comes out, everybody bought a copy in Greenwich Village, and he decides to send a gift book on to Jung. Uh, and it turns out that it doesn't stop there. Oppenheim started a major literary magazine called The Seven Arts. And this famous literary magazine of the day was financed through the uh, work of Beatrice Hinkle. So this is a very tight little circle of contacts and influence. So now to speak about Jung and his psychological ideas at this time. Why was Jung so popular with this crowd? Because he was including spirituality along with sexuality in his ideas about exploring the human personality. We're all familiar with the sexuality emphasis of Freud, but Jung, one of Jung's splits was that he wanted to include the spiritual dimension. Uh, and this was very in the moment because as Steve will elaborate, William James's ideas about the varieties of religious experience of the stream of consciousness were known and taken up by all these people. I know Stephen will elaborate on that a little bit more than I will here, so I'll just pivot uh, to Whitman. Whitman's understanding of the self began with his early readings of Emerson and Hindu philosophy. But it didn't just stop there with philosophy. The very important Canadian psychiatrist, Maurice Buck, became a friend and an early biographer. And it's due to Buck's influence that Whitman was able to keep up later in his life with the new terms of contemporary psychology and psychiatry. He supplemented his understanding of the self by starting to include such terms as the ego and the unconscious, which were much more of that late 19th century time that Jung picks up on Freud and others into the 20th century. But with that, I think I could pivot to Stephen. If you'd like to pick up with my focus on psychology, I invited Stephen to pick up with some of that work on William James, but in particular, some of the themes that came up with the newest developments of anthropology. Stephen, if you'd like to pick things up there. Sure. Well, the, um, the important link, I think, uh, with regards to Jung and 
the break with Freud over the libido theory was over the idea of uh, the spiritualization of the libido. By this time, he had met William James twice, uh, the first time at Clark University in 1909, and then again in 1910 when he returned. Um, he read the varieties of religious experience and was very influenced by the book, but mostly I think he was in, influenced by the presence of William James, who he uh, admired and uh, uh, quoted rather frequently in his, his writings. Um, the, the connection, I think, to Jung and psychology is interesting. Um, Jung, of course, coined the term archetype, and Whitman also used the term, as did Nietzsche. Uh, Whitman spoke of the archetypes of literature. I speak about this in my book. Um, the, the connection with James is not uh, yet uh, fully understood, I think, by the Jungian uh, movement. And uh, I've uh, got a, a book in uh, press right now uh, on William James and C.G. Jung, Doorways to the Self, which is being published by Analytical Psychology Press. I just got the galleys today, uh, in fact, and- uh, A synchronicity. <laughs> this meeting. <laughs> so the, the presence of William James in Jung psychology is something that really needs to be looked at more closely, I think, and how uh, uh, the, the Jung, of course, used the term religion a lot in his Terry lectures in 1937. Uh, when he came to Yale University to speak, and he gave a nod to William James, but it was on uh, the psychology of religion, his lectures. Um, uh, so regarding anthropology uh, that uh, Jay mentioned, um, that's a length also that uh, uh, would require a lot of, of time to go into. Uh, my... Uh, uh, contribution to uh, an understanding of Whitman as a poet shaman really comes from personal experience. Um, and that's through my relationship with the uh, Santa Cruz poet, uh, William Everson, who I had a series of conversations with before he died in uh, 1994. And um, this was in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which now are in this blaze. And uh, I hope his, his cabin survived uh, the fires. Um, but uh, he was the one who really introduced me to this concept. Uh, I went down to interview him on the, uh, the influence of uh, shamanism on um, American poetry. And that's what the book uh, centers on. Whitman is a, a main focus, but also the poet Robinson Jeffers. And so the credit for that to that anthropological link to shamanism, I think really uh, should go to Everson for his uh, uh, connection. And the interesting thing is that uh, Everson, uh, after he left the Dominican order as a monk, uh, he disrobed himself at the University of um, Davis, UC Davis uh, on stage and then fled the stage. And he didn't know what he was gonna wear after that. And what he Put on was a buckskin vest and a bear claw necklace and assumed the mantle of a poet shaman. So when he met uh, uh, some of the leading uh, poets in the West Coast, the beat uh, generation poets, uh, they would sometimes uh, refer to him wryly as the old shaman because he, he carried that mantle uh, in his, uh, what Jung called the persona. He, he assumed that costume. So I think I'll just leave it there for now and uh, let Jay carry this forward to the next stage of our talk. Well, picking up on Jung, so Jung visits America in 1913. He doesn't return until 1925. And this trip was a whole new focus for Jung because he pivoted from his New York base to going west. 
like so many of the creative New Yorkers of the day, the 20s, he followed them to, to New Mexico. Um, Jung was very well connected uh, with some very prominent American uh, families, among them the Rockefellers and the McCormicks. So when one of them says, I'll pay, I'll pay for your trip to Taos, it's all expenses paid, Jung couldn't pass up the offer. So he, he arrives in New York, takes a train to Chicago, where he meets some of his colleagues there, and then they take the Santa Fe, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe down to Santa Fe, but eventually ended up in the Grand Canyon. They return to Santa Fe, but the most important moment for Jung is he goes up to Taos, where he spends a very memorable day speaking with one of the village Pueblo elders who goes by the name Mountain Lake. Um, it's a very, very critical moment in Jung's lived experience. Uh, it was the because in his book, Symbols of Transformation, he did address the Native American component of the white psyche, mm -hmm. but it was more a little bit psychoanalytic. He talked about the Indian ideal that by 1912 with the natives, the Native Americans locked up on reservations in the American, white American psyche, they were no longer the savage. They were almost a hero figure, if you will, in the white psyche. Um, of course, although we're now jettisoning redskins, <laughs> nicknames, and the rest of that, initially, I would argue that a lot of that was meant, although patronizing, in a positive way, that the Native American uh, exhibited the skills that many so-called over-civilized white people thought were being lost, that you had to get back to nature. Mm -hmm. You had to be in tune with the seasons mm -hmm. like the vanishing so-called red man was, to use that old cliche. But the red man so-called was not vanishing. And I think this is to Jung's credit mm -hmm. that he didn't want to know Native Americans through anthropological literature, he wanted to beat them face to face, literally. Right. So it was arranged through a West Coast figure, anthropologist, a figure named Jaime de Angulo, a very important figure in the early Bay Area cultural scene. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew Jung, he arranged the visit to the Grand Canyon and up to Taos, where Jung spent, again, a very memorable day. It's well worth reading uh, that chapter of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Uh, and what he was able to do, although the time was brief, and there's still debate how intimately Mountain Lake would have shared intimate tribal knowledge and mythology and customs and rituals, he certainly did share with what was publicly available to the general public of the day. And it certainly meant a great deal to Jung because he felt that he was experiencing firsthand a living, what he called mytho-poetic tradition mm -hmm. about the role of the sun, of the water, of mountains, of the whole natural cycle. And so I think that was one of his great appreciations, but also just a great appreciation for what he was to come using the famous uh, history of religion term, the numinosity of nature. The nature was not a dead entity for exploitation. It was a living entity the trees, the water, the animals, the importance of totem animals. 
apparently when Jung climbed the ladder to the roof of the Pueblo buildings, the people laughed because they said, your totem animal must be a big bear because that's the way you climbed the ladder to the roof. And of course, Jung had a great sense of humor and he so loved that they could identify a totem animal for him. So, so I think it's important that Jung, and I think we'll see Whitman, deeply understood the role of history of religions and the critical importance for a cross-cultural poetics and psychology. So Stephen, I don't know if you'd like to add a little bit more there before we read uh, the poem. I Something to add? Go right into the poem. Okay. Uh, you, you covered a lot of uh, ground there. I have nothing more to add at this point, other than the fact that Jaime had been in California and spent time with the Achumawi tribe. And uh, as an anthropologist, he was doing ethno psychological and biographical research with the Achumawi. Now Jung was very interested in the Achumawi and he asked Jaime to get the story of the creation myth of the Mount Shasta tribe in California and he paid Jaime $500 to get that story. <laughs> that's <laughs> Which back that's a lot of money. <laughs> 1920, <laughs> 1921. Yeah. So we should really uh, go into Okay. That. So with that said, I am going to read sections one and three of chanting, and Stephen will alternate by reading sections two and four. Chanting the square deific. Out of the one advancing, out of the sides, out of the old and new, out of the square entirely divine, solid, four-sided, all the sides needed. From this side, Jehovah am I, old Brahm I, and I, Saturnius, am. Not time affects me, I am time, modern as any unpersuadable, relentless, executing righteous judgments. As the earth, the father, the brown old Kronos with laws, aged beyond computation, yet ever new, ever with those mighty laws rolling. Relentless, I forgive no man. Whoever sins dies. I will have that man's life. Therefore, let none expect mercy. Have the seasons, gravitation, the appointed days, mercy? No more have I. But as the seasons and gravitation, and as all the appointed days, that forgive not, I dispense from this side judgments inexorable without the least remorse. Consolator most mild, the promised one advancing, with gentle hand extended, the mightier God am I. Foretold by prophets and poets in their most rapt prophecies and poems, from this side, lo, the Lord Christ gazes, lo, Hermes I, lo, mine is Hercules' face. All sorrow, labor, suffering, I telling it, absorb in myself. Many times have I been rejected, taunted, put in prison, and crucified, and many times shall be again. All the world have I given up for my dear brothers and sisters sake, for the soul's sake, wending my way through the homes of men, rich or poor, with the kiss of affection. For I am affection, 
I am the cheer bringing God with hope and all in closing charity. With indulgent words as to children, with fresh and sane words, mine only, young and strong I pass knowing well, I am destined myself to an early death. But my charity has no death, my wisdom dies not, neither early nor late, and my sweet love bequeathed here and elsewhere never dies. Aloof, dissatisfied, plotting revolt, comrade of criminals, brother of slaves, crafty, despised, a drudge, ignorant, with sudra face and worn brow, black, but in the depths of my heart, proud as any, lifted now and always against whoever, scorning, assumes to rule me. Morose, full of guile, full of reminiscences, brooding with many wiles. Though it was thought I was baffled and dispelled and my wiles done, but that will never be. Defiant, I, Satan, still live, still utter words, in new lands duly appearing and old ones also. Permanent here, from my side, warlike, equal with any, real as any. Nor time, nor change shall, shall ever change me or my words. Santa Spirita, breather, life, beyond the light, lighter than light, beyond the flames of hell, joyous, leaping easily above hell, beyond paradise, perfumed solely with mine own perfume, including all life on earth, touching, including God, including Savior and Satan, ethereal, pervading all, for without me, what were all? What were God? Essence of forms, life of the real identities, permanent, positive, namely the unseen. Life of the great round world, the sun and stars, and of man, I, the general soul. Here, the square finishing, the solid, I, the most solid, breathe my breath also through these songs. Very nice, Steve. Stephen. Would you like to pick up on the chanting breath theme and then I'll bring in some of the other things we talked about? Well, I'll say a few words about it for sure. Um, the poem has its inception in the 1847 notebook, uh, Albert Wilson. Um, this is a, a notebook where Whitman engages with a, uh, an archetypal figure that he calls the fierce wrestler. Uh, and the, the reference to the breath is, is very evident there where the wrestler who infuses Whitman's visioning ego with the grit and jets of life says to Walt, I dilate you with tremendous breath. Dilation means opening, widening, spaciousness, enlargement. Uh, this is something that Whitman got, this skywide vision, I think, from his reading of well, Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, The Poet, uh, published in 1844. So the, the concept of the breath is already there in his first notebook as a spiritual experience of some kind that happens while he's engaged in an active imagination, what Jung would call an active imagination uh, exercise where he's talking back and forth with this figure. Um, and he undergoes a transformation through this uh, experience. Um, he was 28 years old and um, seven years later in uh, Leaves of Grass, uh, 
we find the lines, my respiration and inspiration, the beating of my heart, the passing of blood and air through my lungs, the sniff of green leaves and dry leaves and of the shore. And he goes on, but this, this idea of the breath is present throughout uh, Whitman's uh, poetry. Um, and of course, today during a time of uh, COVID-19, when we're all uh, concerned about uh, the very precious breath of life, um, this is a poem that I think we could meditate on a little bit uh, to uh, help us understand how vitalizing uh, the experiences were for Whitman when he was engaged in this uh, process uh, that he called vocalism, the divine power to speak words. It was a technique that Whitman uniquely developed in his own right to uh, descend to these uh, levels of the psyche, the unconscious, that I call the shamanic uh, structures of consciousness that, that allowed him to chant, that allowed him to get in touch with these primal rhythms. And um, the 1860 uh, edition of Leaves of Grass, where vocalism appears, is a magnificent piece. My friend, uh, Neil Richardson, who may be in the audience, has developed uh, his own ideas about the Walt Whitman meditation, which I uh, want to refer uh, listeners to. Um, and it was Neil who introduced me to this 1860 edition where uh, it was very clear in the opening uh, pages of that volume, which I got to see at the Library of Congress, um, that um, he spoke of the, the uh, the breath of the um, indigenous uh, presences that, uh, that he was in touch with uh, as he was uh, writing his lines. So the, the brilliance from uh, a psychological standpoint of Whitman in formulating this uh, concept of a square deific is that in his uh, trial lines for the uh, leaves of Grass, he wrote on a title page, uh, Deus Quadrion, which in Latin means it's quaternity. It's basically Jung's four-sided model of the self, which includes Satan, the shadow, evil, blackness, and the feminine, Santa Spirita, that he, he feminizes the presence that he embodies in the last lines, the last stanza, where he breathes his breath into these songs. So this idea of the breath, Santa Spirita as the breath, she is the incarnating spirit uh, that rounds out the square and creates what Jung calls wholeness, a completeness, a, a sense of unity in the personality. But Whitman is creating this, of course, in 1865 in drum taps. So this comes out of the carnage that Whitman viewed firsthand on the battlefields where Satan was on both sides, where he saw the maggots in the wounds and was traumatized and had a war paralysis afterwards that, that led to his, uh, his stroke, as Whitman said. Uh, whether there was a causal relationship, we don't know, but that's how Whitman experienced it. Um, so this idea of the breath, he, he saw soldiers north and south take their last breath in the hospital wards. So he puts this together in an ingenious way, but it's not just a personal uh, self symbol, what Jung would call a self symbol, a uh, symbol of totality. Uh, for the human uh, psyche and the, the, the collective, for the American soul. He's putting it forth as a new model of the self for the world, because if we don't keep the shadow in consciousness, if we don't keep Satan in our psychic inventory, as Jung said in his 1847 essay, The Fight with the Shadow, we're going to destroy ourselves as a species. And I think Whitman was already onto this, 
Whitman was that far ahead of his times. That's how visionary he was, that he had foreseen this and created a psychological model, a structural model of the self that really anticipates you. So I'll end with that, Jay, and let you take it from there. Well, just, uh, this is probably the most significant intersection of the two men. Um, and of course, um, Whitman, and then later Jung and so many, and Nietzsche saw the bankruptcy of Christianity by this time, that it was form without spirit. Mm -hmm. um, Jung experienced that in his own life. Mm -hmm. Whitman saw that. He was raised Quaker, which was a little more connected with the inner light and spirit, but certainly in the society around him, he was certainly cognizant of the gross limitations of the model of the deity. The Trinity was incomplete. Father, so-called son, and spirit, which is covered in the poem. Mm -hmm. But then what I found so significant is that he injects Satan as the brother of Christ mm -hmm. in the third place because that starts to complete one dimension of the quaternio for, for um, uh, Whitman. But then he completes it as you so eloquently stated by the feminizing of spirit. And himself, his and body. Himself, and his own body. He brings the body self in yes. at the end, that the breath is the integrative factor. The body is the integrative factor. This is what William James called the body self in his 1890 Principles of Psychology. It's, it's Whitman's unique contribution as a homosexual man to bring the feminine into American culture as a new part of the God image of the in the new image of, of what, what could help America round out its democracy, make it spiritual, take it from the economic and political levels to a more spiritual level. See, this is Whitman's genius. And that's what I talk about in my book, Spiritual Democracy, how he brought together three levels of democracy into the spiritual level. That, and so, this is really about incarnation, this poem. This is about Whitman embodying this, this, this image and, and becoming one with it and then bequeathing it to the future of, of society uh, worldwide. I think it's a, a magnificent poem to have selected, uh, Jay. I think your, your intuition was just right. Well, thank you. Particularly right now, while you know we're dealing with uh, COVID-19 and also with the California fires that are just raging out of control. And in fact, the Redwoods uh, have been threatened. And of course, Whitman wrote his magnificent song of the Redwood tree where he chants the voice of the song of the Redwood tree. He sings that song beautifully. Um, so, yeah. Wow, that's just amazing stuff. It really blows me away. I had so much I learned there. Um, we're getting a little low on time. Um, yes. and I, I had so many thoughts. I was wondering if you would humor me with some, some of my questions that I have for you two, uh, having listened to you guys. Um, uh, for one, um, one thing that I'm uh, struck by is the way you were discussing their relationship and how, you know, it seems like Whitman anticipated, it's a word we often use, um, Jung's ideas with his like fourfold Godhead mm -hmm. as embodied in chanting this great deific. But it makes me think about where Whitman um, got it uh, and, and what was in the air at the time, as we often say. And um, w looking back from Whitman, what do we see as, as we trace this trajectory um, uh, from Young through Whitman and so on? You guys mentioned Emerson, of course, that is probably one mutual interlocutor for the two of them, who also, of course, greatly influenced um, James. So we've got this kind of Emerson, James, Whitman, Nexus, that uh, I think is important. But even then beyond that, I think that we, you know, from my research on Whitman, 
if I, as I think about, you know, I just published an edited volume of Whitman's journals um, and, and reading through all of his pre-Civil War journals as he was using to write the poems of the first edition of Leaves of Grass. Um, it strikes me that perhaps Whitman and Jung have share a mutual interest in what we today call comparative religion. Absolutely. And that the actual origins of their ideas come from the, you know, the mutual study of things like Hinduism, Vedanta, um, the idea of multiplying Godhead, mm -hmm. multiple Godhead, many in one, um, preserving an aspect of evil within the good and so on. I, I think most of, of Hinduism, um, I thought I'd throw that out there and, and see if you guys had any other ideas about um, mutual influences that may have set both Whitman and uh, Jung on, on, their, on their trajectories. Well, if I may start off that very good question and very good insight because they have a shared interest in history of religions. The world was becoming more cosmopolitan. People were starting to step outside their immediate religious identity that they would have been born with and raised with. Uh, certainly, uh, I think the Quaker influence played a role for uh, Whitman to think a little beyond the more constricted uh, Calvinistic mindset that was so dominant at the time. He certainly opened up to Emerson's transcendental strains from Hinduism and Jung also. Jung was a, had a wide appetite for religion, ethnography. The catalog of his library is a little bit mind blowing. I've analyzed the catalog and just, you know, his whole career uh, at his fingertips. And we could, and this actually personally began for me when I read section 41 for our marathon in honor of his 200th birthday. He litters the poems. Uh, what struck me enchanting is he throws in Hermes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, a Greek god, mm -hmm. Greek mythology, yes. uh, Brahma. Brahman. Mm -hmm. Just Brahma. And yeah. just. No was, doubt, uh, Matt. He, he read the Upanishads. He read the Bhagavad Gita. He read the Mahabharata. Whitman was very well read in world religions, but I, I agree. I think that the, the biggest influence for Whitman's uh, great synthesis of the world religions comes from, from India. That's my, that's my intuition. I suppose the scholar that got there first, and whose name is, um, or at least the book, I'm trying to remember his name, um, uh, the book's called Whitman in the Light of Vedantic Philosophy. Have you guys seen this book? I know the title, I've never read it. I haven't seen that one, yet. I believe the author's last name is Chandri. I'm sorry, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, but I think in Whitman's scholarship, he's, he gets credit for being the first person to really go into this. If any other people are interested in pursuing it further, uh, Walt Whitman in the light of Vedantic mm -hmm. philosophy. I'll double check that. Um, maybe um, uh, uh, anybody in the, who's listening wants to double check that and uh, get through this. I, I could just add briefly that uh, Whitman died in, in 1892. Swami Vivekananda came to America for the Parliament of World Religions in 1893. So... Vedanta had not yet really become popularized, and William James met uh, Vivekananda twice at Harvard, uh, 1894 and 1896. So Vedanta clearly influenced James, but how Vedanta influenced Whitman would be of great interest to me. It's difficult to trace because some of these ideas were also being processed by, for example, the German idealist philosophers who Whitman was also reading at the time. So at the same time as he was reading uh, the first uh, available English translations of Hindu sacred texts that were available in the New World, um, the exact same translations that Emerson had read and which also sparked his essays and lectures. Um, it's all a big melting pot stew of ideas and it gets difficult to trace where you know, one starts and stops. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I don't have any answer to that, but I would think that trying to distinguish between, say, the influence of Fichte and Schilling mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the influence of, of Vedanta and Hinduism and, and, then, and then the processing of Emerson mm -hmm. at the same time, who himself was also that makes sense. the same German idealists. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, a, it's, it's kind of beyond my pay grade. <laughs> uh, 
um, <laughs> dollar there. I don't, I don't know. That's, that's the first kind of thoughts that I, I have in trying to assess it. Do we have uh, comments from anybody, questions? Um, the chat, not, not a lot has showed up here in the chat session, but I've got uh, another question. We've only got about uh, four or five more minutes. Um, so maybe I could ask this. Um, now, you need to correct me here if I'm wrong, because I very well could be about Jung. I'm not very knowledgeable about, about Jung. But listening to you talk about, about Jung and his passion for meeting Native Americans and how that really brought to life some of his own ideas and, and grounded them in, in, in the real world. Um, it makes me think that Jung, and this, this is the way he's different than Whitman, um, sought out historical examples and um, I'm going to use the word nostalgia maybe um, for um, ancient cultures and, and valued them um, over contemporary society. And, it, and the way you're talking about it, it sounds like he's privileging um, Native American religious views. Whitman, I may be wrong about that. I, I don't think I'm wrong about the next thing I'm going to say. Whitman did not. Um, Whitman believed fully that whatever you might want to call it, archetypes, the um, ongoing, consistent, formal spiritual energies that animate consciousness and reality, Whitman believed that those things were absolutely just as valuable. In fact, they were most real in the present. There's zero nostalgia in that. Whitman aligns Hinduism and other world religions in order to express how they culminate in him and in the present moment in his democratic religious mm -hmm. vision of America. Mm -hmm. um, so my question here, that build up was to ask you, you know, how wrong am I about my assessment of Jung as perhaps being more of a nostalgist or at least historical, historical minded thinker um, than Whitman when it comes to this? Am I wrong or right about that? And what's the upshot of this? You know, what do we make of it? Does this mean Whitman's like even more ahead of his time? <laughs> me, it strikes me as a more radical and provocative idea to say that all these things are even more real right now than to go looking around for them in historical examples. It's, it's more exciting, at least to me. So I thought I'd throw that out there. I think Jung would agree with you. And certainly, you know, the Janus face, we look back, but we look forward. Um, you know, as a therapist, remember, I think one thing that unites the two men is they were therapeutic personalities. They wanted to heal. Mm -hmm. heal themselves, heal others, and heal society, which is a very tall order. Um, and Jung can, has been dismissed as somebody with, you mentioned nostalgia. I know in cultural studies, it's this idea of the primitivist mentality that appealed to creative avant-garde white culture in Europe and America, Euro-American white culture in the first part of the century. And, but I dare, I think Jung, when he went first to the Southwest and also to East Africa, almost within the same year, it was almost as if he was trying to do what has been called salvage archeology. span He knew that both of those cultures were on the tip of being inundated by dominant white culture. They were imperialism, colonialism were so rife. And he got an earful from Mountain Lake about the racist side of white culture. And he really took that to heart. He was very conscious of what we, what side talked about the other, the cultural other has its roots in Jung's original concept of the shadow. And it does not mean inferior. The biggest misconception people have about what Jung called the inferior was it was not a value judgment. It was a location of the psyche. It's not inferior by value, but it's a lost element within one mm -hmm. and it needs to be restored. Got and it. so you visited those cultures, not out of the nostalgia, which I, I think is a valid point to question, but to bring that back to a larger public to expand consciousness. Just Stephen, to let you know, we're almost out of time. Maybe you guys two more minutes, I think. Okay, right. Stephen. I just want to say, I think you made an, an important point, uh, Matt. 
Thanks. Um, uh, there's there's something there in that comparison that I think holds some validity. I, I I'd be interested in exploring that more deeply. I love this stuff. I could talk with you guys about this stuff all day, and I wish I could. Um, in fact, you know, we we just because the stream needs to end doesn't mean our conversation needs to. If you guys have some more time, oh, I would be happy to stay on, Stephen. I don't know. Stephen's on the West Coast with a different schedule, <laughs> but Me. but anyway. No. Um, do we have I want, do we have time for one more question, um, or is that it? I've got a partner here who's uh, keeping me. Okay, one more question for you guys. We did get one um, in the YouTube stream. Um, I'm not sure who asked this, but uh, the question was posed. Um, Whitman had a connection to the Greeks. Even Oscar Wilde once said that Whitman's life was like a Greek tragedy. Um, do you think there is some truth to this? And do you see some kind of union connection between Whitman and the Greeks um, from a union perspective? Dionysian. He was a Dionysian poet. Um, in Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, the Dionysian poet is the one who descends to that level of Greek uh, society and culture through an archetypal regression back, as Jung would say, into the collective unconscious, and then makes those uh, connections while in a state of rapt ecstasy or trance. And this is, this is definitely an intoxicated, according to Nietzsche, state, but I don't think it was an intoxication for Whitman. I think it was a conscious state. And maybe yeah. that's where Vedanta helped him. The intoxication would have had to have been natural given his lack of interest in drugs and alcohol for most of his life. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's just absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, uh, there's a lot more to be said. Um, it sounds to me like one thing we've learned for sure is that um, Whitman for Jung was seen through the lens of James. Um, uh, this is James's Walt Whitman that became Jung's Walt Whitman. Um, so there's so much more that could be said there. Um, maybe we could conclude by just mentioning your current book projects and what you guys are working on so that our listeners can um, look, for, look out for those in the future. And, and then I'll, I guess I'll guess let us, let us go. Well, I mentioned my book already, so I'll turn it over to Jay. That's the book on James and Young. Tell us about it, Jay. And, uh, well, my current projects are learning to Zoom. Zoom, <laughs> Zoom, Zoom. <laughs> um, a lot of my energy now is being devoted to the Young Library and how do libraries, how do all the things we do, like the Walt Whitman Initiative and libraries, how do we reposition ourselves in this time of change. Um, so I'm devoting a lot of my energy into administrative stuff with the library. Um, and also what is on pause for me is working on several projects, uh, events about Joseph Campbell, who is in the background of some of this talk we're having. Uh, one of them is gonna be at the New York Public Library it was to have been in April, and now it's being rolled over in light of the uh, the pause button, the giant pause button that we're all experiencing. So right now, the writing is on a smaller scale and a little more active in the administrative zone. Got it. Uh, we also appreciate all of your help um, in the Walt Women Initiative, too. Oh, you... oh I, I guess we're out of time. Um, that's okay. it. So I will... Uh... Um, I'm told that we should uh, say our concluding remarks. So okay. um, I'd like to stay, thank Stephen Herman and Jay Sherry for this enlightening conversation. Um, this is the third talk in the robust American Love Speaker Series hosted by the Walt Whitman Initiative. Please check out our website, um, waltwhitmaninitiative.com for future upcoming events. Uh, I'll be giving a talk in September on what we learned editing Walt Whitman's notebooks and journals. And we have quite a few other talks coming up too. They're all on Thursdays at six o'clock. You can look for us here. This is our YouTube channel. Um, please consider subscribing, liking the channel so that uh, you'll be caught up on the newest events from the Walt Whitman Initiative. And with that, I will say goodbye and thank you to Stephen Herman and Jay Sherry. Okay, thank you, for Stephen, sure. and thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bye, guys. guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Adios. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.